Okay, so uh, when Danny asked me to do this, <clears throat> he wrote me a text and it was, quote, can you speak about the joys of plain air painting and your work? Um, and that question, light and simple and informal as could be, somehow landed in me uh, with enough force to trigger something more existential than I had anticipated. Um, <laughs> Um, of course, I can speak about the joys of plein air painting. I love plein air painting, but I'm not a plein air painter. Uh, and when I think of plein air painters, I think of them as a sort of ordained fellowship of painters who, who have this drive to go anywhere and paint anything outdoors anytime with amazing abilities to capture all the views. Uh, I never quite had that relationship with plein air painting, uh, but I'm going to share with you how my relationship with it grew and how it's ever evolving and how I use it as a counterbalance to my usual studio practice. So just first a little bit about my studio paintings. Um, my work that you might be familiar with already is all done from memory and imagination and invention. Um, I don't use photos to paint from and I don't really do plein air sketches of landscapes, skies, or clouds that I take back to the studio and work from. Uh, all the work you've seen is just conjured from memory or invented. Um, and it's a loose definition of memory. It's not quite a literal recollection of a specific sky or cloud or place in a, as in a photographic memory. It's more a version of what a memory felt like, um, so it's distilled down a bit. Uh, painting from memory and imagination is a way I use to cultivate and practice um, paying attention and, and how I refine mindfulness. So instead of stopping to take photos of beautiful cloud formations to paint from later, I take a moment to look at them with the intent of becoming fully aware not only of their shape and color, but of as much of the context of that moment as I can take in. Um, I pay them attention, and I, it, that feels like I end up seeing and absorbing all of it beyond just the visual. Uh, it's a bit like taking a photo if, along with the image the camera recorded, all of your senses and memories, physical, mental, and spiritual associations. Um, that's what I try to pull from when I'm working on paintings at the studio. Um, at this point, my studio paintings have gained their own momentum and the creative process involved in making them has become a practice I can return to and repeat in order to achieve a desired end. Um, I like to consider it a working meditation. Uh, at, at its best, I try to paint from a zeroed out mind, meaning I leave the static of day-to-day -day worries out of the process and devote my energy to the nothingness of a blank canvas. Uh, nothingness can be super liberating, but trying to focus on it when your bills are late and you just scheduled a tooth extraction for Thursday can be challenging. Um, so it's not always easy or possible to get to that place, and when I need help, I sort of default to what I learned from musical improvisation. Um, I establish a key, I pick a theme, and I just start following it. Uh, I let paint paint and get my mind out of the way, the same way I would let a rhythm section establish a groove while I waited to play a melody over it. And after a few minutes, it usually turns to a momentary, reactionary, reflexive process of decision-making and creative problem-solving with the intention of reaching beyond the technical and into the heart of the experience. I think of it like trying to stack the decisions about color and composition and value on top of each other in order to build um, a sort of ladder to the metaphysical and transcendent. My goal always is to get to a place where I stop thinking about painting while I'm painting. Um, it's a brilliant sensation to conjure that kind of creative freedom. At its core, it's not just about painting or any art form, really. That kind of creativity requires presence. Um, I, it requires a clear and clean energy, free of the burdensome past and the worrisome future. Uh, it requires that you stand only in the moment you're in, which 
makes one feel more like a channel and a vehicle for art to move through rather than uh, just mechanistically ex executing a task. Um, so plain air painting used to be a steady source of misery for me, although I, <laughs> although I loved everything about it. Um, being in nature, the gear, uh, opportunities for packing a great lunch and spending the day with friends, in, painting in the wild. I loved everything except what I made and how I felt after I made it. Um, so, uh, after spending days outdoors and loving the sun and openness, I would feel this sort of desperate sadness and frustration about how difficult it was for me to make a painting that passed as remotely accept uh, uh, acceptable. Um, this is me. This is New Mexico when I was invited to do plein air um, and have a gallery show um, on Canyon Road in 20, uh, 2007, I think it was. My paintings looked uh, nothing like those of my art historical heroes, and I felt embarrassed when I compared them to those I'd seen of contemporary plein air painters. Uh, my joy for the experience was incredibly out of proportion with my sense of artistic achievement or competence. Um, it all just felt like a million miles away from the joyful conjuring um, that took place in the studio. Instead of a free flow of music-like momentum, it felt tedious and forced, which soured everything. Um, I was thinking too much about how to paint like other people I, I admired and not feeling anything about what I was painting and feeling only angry because despite having been on numerous plein air trips during and after college, I was never taught anything about how to do it. Nothing. Um, I had a million questions, but I didn't even know what they were. Um, and as a note of context, just during this time period, the internet wasn't as enormous and accessible as it is today. It was years before we carried supercomputer phones around that could answer any question immediately. I relied on art books and magazines, and I was very solitary then, so my peer group was 19th century painters who didn't talk much. So um, at that point, also at that point in my development, um, I was severely, I was a severely harsh critic of my abilities, uh, my skills, myself in general. Um, I fought the idea of perfectionism daily, which really isn't an idea so much as it is a, a tyranny and a trap. Um, I set up this impossible standard created by chronic comparison to peers, both contemporary and historical. Uh, any paintings I made during that phase were dead on arrival. Um, in fact, they were arguably dead even before arrival because that kind of judgment kills creativity. And I, I compared them to death, like kind of literally. Um, the more I looked at other paintings, the more I felt those painters were just born with it and I wasn't. Uh, that frustration that lasted years and years, and honestly, there was a part of me that felt like it was just not worth pursuing because the level of discomfort and frustration was so disproportionately high. Um, no matter how beautiful the location or how fun the experience of plain air days were, I had this feeling like I couldn't wait to be done and get back to the solitary studio experience that I felt... It felt familiar, and I could control the light, and I could feel like I wasn't a beginner. Um, and that was the epiphany moment for me. A red flag went up, and I had to shift the focus a bit here because it felt like there was more at stake than I had been considering. Uh, I had been resisting being and feeling like a beginner. So um, there was a part of me that judged that stage as something that I should have been past at that point in my career. And so slowing down to learn basics felt like backtracking and losing time. Uh, I re-examined the idea of being a beginner. Uh, instead of looking at it like wasting time and backtracking, I decided to use it as a way to make everything new again and to look at things as if I'd never seen them before and to paint like I had no idea how. Um, my intention was to rewire my thought process and ultimately change and expand my creative process. Um, I decided to view plein air painting as a retreat 
from the environment and creative process that I thought made me who I was because I was steeped in it every day all the time. Uh, but what if I could leave that for just a bit and let myself feel like a stranger in a strange land? Uh, what if I allowed myself to take the pressure off and stop trying to make a great painting and instead just be present and look at nature as if I'd never seen it before and treat paintings uh, like small recordings of that experience rather than attempts at making masterpieces or paintings that look like paintings I admired or you know capturing the light or likeness of a landscape in front of me. I have no interest in capturing anything ever. Uh, I'd rather be a witness. I'd rather be with it as if in dialogue and in that dialogue I'd mostly aim to be the listener. And so I went out by myself. Uh, I found this spot along the canal that was fairly secluded, which was super important to me, this spot in particular. Um, I wanted, I, I needed the security of seclusion in order to free myself up and not have to deal with people stopping to look or standing behind me commenting on every move. Um, and I made some of the worst paintings I've ever made. And, and they were glorious. Uh, every gorgeous failure was a bomb I threw against the walls of the perfectionism cage I lived in for all those years. Uh, instead of feeling awful uh, after a day of painting, I began feeling elated. Like the worse the paintings were, the better I felt. Um, I was working it out and suddenly I had tangible questions to ask and it was the work that answered them. Uh, and we can talk about painting all we want. You don't get good unless you do it. I love the lessons that came with, from every awkwardly composed, value deficient, color impaired disaster that I spent all day making. Um, it was also a really good feeling to do the work instead of living in my mind. To actually keep my word to myself that I was going to get good at this and show up to do it rather than listen to the incessant voice of my inner critic trying to convince me that if I wasn't born with it, it wasn't going to happen. Um, or better yet, um, that trying to get good at this now was a waste of time and I should just go to the studio and paint cloud paintings that people know me for and that sell. Um, to run contrary to that hypercritical inner voice is a test of strength and endurance. It's like a Goliath-sized monster that's built out of all the critical voices and judgments you've heard your whole life, as well as all the ones you're afraid of hearing in the future. Uh, and you can't take it down by hurling one big rock at it one time, though. Uh, it's lots of little rocks, day by day, month after month, that finish it off. I made that part of my mission of going out to paint, and then instead of an activity that undid me, I turned plein air painting into a way to ground myself, to gain as much technical knowledge and practice as I could, to build on that practice faithfully, and lay bare any fear or judgment that held me back for years. While I was making that switch in perspective, I somehow got a call to teach a plein air workshop. Um, <laughs> So it was odd that at a time when I felt the least accomplished, knowledgeable, or proven in this field, I was being asked to teach it to others. Um, but I was gaining some momentum in my own practice and super excited about sharing what I figured out uh, with my students, so I accepted. And I looked at it as a way to teach to what I never got as a student. Um, I knew that my experience of learning to see something differently and repeating it until it was internalized was transformational for me. So I imagined that it would be the same for students. So I started to develop a program that addressed all the issues I had as a passionate yet frustrated and uninformed young painter. I wanted to transform all the issues that had given me grief for years into clarity and direction for other painters. I wanted to work with students to improve the technical aspects of painting, but I also wanted to leave space to consider the emotional components that shape people's creative processes. Um, art making is about so much more than the art we're making sometimes, and empathy is a vital element in teaching it. I started doing small workshops, uh, like once a spring or summer at 
my solitary canal spot or from the perch over the waterfall at Scott Park, like you see there. Um, they focused on all the fundamentals that I struggled with and relied heavily on mixed skill levels of students having their work discussed and kind of holistically deconstructed in comprehensive group critiques. Um, it was never a demo heavy style of teaching in that I didn't expect or want students to paint like me, although I don't mind if they use imitation like stepping stones, to, but as long as they're getting to their own voice. I teach to the individual and am really good at finding the root of the struggle as well as the root of the strength. Um, I, I want the students to burrow into themselves and find the thing that's keeping them from the next level. If it's drawing, value, color, composition, fine. I know how to fix that. If it's never finishing anything because you're afraid of it being judged, okay, I'm here for that too. They grew into larger and more frequent workshops in spring, uh, summer, fall, and throughout the Lehigh Valley and beyond. Um, this past spring, I welcomed students from Texas, Arkansas, Connecticut, and Virginia to my studio in Easton for workshops. Two years ago, I was approached by the West Park Civic Association to help build a cultural event that would promote the arts and integrate with their community in West Park and West End of Allentown. Um, I had this idea for a long time and I presented them with uh, the idea to uh, teach a three-day plein air workshop to all skill levels and donate all of the tuition to the Baum School of Art where I teach um, to fund scholarships for art education. And in the first two years, that workshop has raised just shy of, just under $4,000 for scholarships. Um, and we already chose the dates for next year and I hope we surpass that. A few years ago, I uh, was going to write a blog post for students that included some resources for plein air painting. Instead, it grew into this printed guidebook for workshop students called Notes on Plein Air. Um, it's a collection of quotes and then a bibliography from some excellent painting resources, as well as some of my own thoughts and exercises I made um, for plein air painting. I've added to it every few months, and I hope to make it available for purchase on my website sometime in the near future. That led to developing a few other workshops, like a cloud and sky painting workshop and a, a, another one called Value Studies for the Practicing Artist, both of which I've taught several times this past year from my studio, as well as guest instructing at other studios. Some upcoming workshops and guidebooks are this fall coming out, one for figure studies, anatomy for artists, and portraiture. The subtitle on those guidebooks is be present, be mindful, be aware, paint. Those words were really just what I repeated to myself over and over again before and during plein air painting sessions in an attempt to kill the anxiety and pressure and judgment that I felt. Um, they've become the foundation for my creative process and approach to teaching. They also remind me um, that it's possible to gain empowerment from what isn't working in your art practice. You don't have to fester with anger and grudges at your past professors. Uh, you don't have to constantly slay yourself with harsh judgment or feel wholly inadequate compared to other artists your age or younger who are firmly rooted in their well-established genres with singular and easily defined labels and substantial steady paychecks. You don't have to identify yourself by what you're not. Uh, and force tons of creativity killing pressure to crack your foundation and ruin your love for art. Um, instead, you can turn your back on all those thoughts and face the direction of the best thing you ever made. I used to think, say, and believe I'm not a plein air painter and that phrase used to demolish my confidence and feed the anxiety I felt about going out to paint. But now, when I say I'm not a plein air painter, it's with this sense of freedom because I'm just a painter. Present, mindful, aware, and painting in the sweet spot of the generous pre present moment. Thanks. Okay. Your, your paintings are beautiful. I love, I love them. I just don't, I can't tell from how large or small they are from the picture.
they, you imagine them to be very large. Yeah, they're, they vary. I mean, some of the ones I showed were like six by six inches. And some of them, like that one is 24 by 48. It's just about that big. And then some of them are five feet by five feet. So they vary. I mean, the, oh, that's kind of cool that you can't tell. Yeah. The size, because the expanse is kind of built in, I think, and that's what I'm shooting for. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Sure. Any other questions? We can talk about technical plain air stuff. I think I got the idea that maybe people wanted to talk about that, but I didn't do that. But if you have technical plain air questions or you want anything at all, I'm here. Maybe I'll just to say that your experience is completely identical to my experience. Is it? Yeah. I mean, yeah, but you're really good. But no, <laughs> no, it, it's, it's, it's constantly, it feels like uh, the most difficult. Yeah, I just, I think this is this year the first year I've done a painting that I didn't think was terrible. You know? Yeah, so but. I, I painted the thing that when I went back and I painted over it, I thought it was so bad. Yeah. Uh, so, I, you know, the one from last year, mm -hmm. you know, I just didn't, it wasn't, I think it's expectation, you say. And, and okay. I think the thing with my hair is, it's such a movement now, it's such a hobby. It's, it's a hobby on some levels for many people. And I always kind of looked at it as a hobby for me, you know, I was, I was, which is kind of, a, I guess, an excuse. You know, right, to right. At it. But I think, I think it's, um, I think it comes down, but I want to find a way, because I, as you know, I can do really tight yeah. studio realism. You know, and and uh, <clears throat> is a way to express something original as a plain air painter. I think, I think the problem with plain air is it is a, well, you're up against the, the great plein air painters are all, they're not the recent past. The, the I mean, there's a lot of great ones now, though. And I think, like, reinventing it. But they're more, they're, yeah. But, but the ones that you, if you go to a, get plein air magazine, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, a lot of those look like they opened up a can of plein air and poured it out, yeah. like, all over. <laughs> um, My favorite is probably the one that came more like Draco Porter or something. Yeah, I mean, but... Too. Right, and I think that's a big challenge, and that's, again, another reason why when I was looking at those as a standard, I was always discouraged because they look different. What I was doing looked wholly different than what that was, and I, and I like, had zero interest in trying to fit myself into that kind of painting. So I, I think that's where the struggle is until you stop struggling and you just be who you are in it and like devote yourself to that part of it so like when I go out and I do anything plain air or even in the studio it's not like it's a challenge to, to not see every other painting I've ever seen you know if I'm going to go paint the bridge in Easton like how many paintings are there of water and a bridge and bushes and sunlight like there's a like there's billions of them so like I see those all and it's hard to not think that those are a source for you to pull from but yet you don't want to be like them at all. And so like that's the struggle and I think the only way through that is to do a ton of paintings that most of them you hate. And, but you have to hate them for a reason and you have to use it to make the next one better. Like, it's not just arbitrary hate you want to throw in judgment at your paintings. That's sort of the other part of it. Well, I want to ask you one more thing, if I may. I don't want to pick up. Sure. But, uh, I want to ask you how, we, how plain air, and really, I don't, I, thought you, I don't know if you talked about it much, but how it's informed your studio. Uh -huh. and, and, and it recess that, and I think you're an exception to this, but a lot of the, I'll call you a realist for lack of a better sure. term. That I know have, that paint out of their head, you know, don't paint from nature, end up with kind of predictable looking paintings, mm -hmm. kind of redundant and kind of, that can be very like almost, well, right. looking something. And plain air forces you to constantly see the randomness in nature and, 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 uh, and, and get you out of that zone that this is, you know, it's unexpected stuff. That, you know, right. Has that affected your studio practice? Uh, yeah. I mean, they're totally different. It's a counterbalance. Like, I, they're, these, the studio paintings and the cloud paintings and the big sky stuff is, is not about nature. 
so much as it is like it's not physical so much as it is metaphysical like it's it's more like you know I I think of them this like altar pieces like the way you would think of an altar piece where you would go to it to like have a presence with it or something like that like it'd be a still point that you can return to and be meditative or not or just a reminder of impermanence but yeah like a little bit more related towards you know I'm I feel sometimes I'm I'm a lot more related to Rothko than I am to you know like Hudson River School guys so but the way that that works and the way that it helped me was that I, you don't want to be ethereal all the time or you're going to just float away. Like I needed groundedness and I like being outside and I like nature and elements and interpreting them and, you know, having a dialogue with them while I'm out there. And so it informs it by being sometimes it's, it's flip side. Um, but it also like, you know, there's a whole bunch of new work at my studio that has a lot more land in it and a lot more, you know, built up everything rather than minimalist. And it's fine. Like, I, I just listen to it the same way as if you were a musician and you wanted to play with an acoustic guitar or an orchestra. Like, it's okay. You can just keep doing your music throughout and change it a little bit. And that's kind of a, the way that it's helped me. Yeah. Uh, what would be like uh, the most opposite type of work that you like, either like the kind of work or an artist or to opposite. the work that you do? To the work that I do? Yeah. The most opposite? I mean... Like stuff that you're drawn to that you want to go see or experience. I mean, uh, lately, uh, I've... You know, lately, a lot of the things I've been moved by the most have been performance art. Uh, my girlfriend is a performance artist, and it was a world that I was vaguely familiar with, but she's done some insanely powerful pieces that I was there for, and it's totally different than a cloud painting, but it's not. Uh, because the heart of it is sort of the heart of it. Like, it's, it, it just, it's sort of connected that way. And there are a lot of things going on in that world that I, I envy their openness and the, the aliveness of it while it's happening just there. And it goes away. And sometimes they take uh, recordings of it, but the experience is gone after it's gone. And that's kind of the impermanence is the theme I have going throughout all of, that's why clouds, that's why I pick those. And that's why I stay with those is the impermanence of it, that it's a reminder that it's going to all go away. But like, this is it right now. And this is what you are in front of and to just be there with it. And the performance art world kind of has that string, that thread running through it as well. Yep. First of all, brilliant uh, presentation. Thank I you. Enjoyed it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, my question is, because I've never done plenty of art myself, um, but how do you capture that moment? I mean, I know you're a visual, you know, you can remember everything, but first of all, how long does it take to make one of these paintings? And can you go back another day and finish it? If you sure. <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> you know, it's a, if you, it's I can, if I pull back and look at some of the plein air ones, It'd be easier to talk about it. This was, this was that, like, this was me. This is where I practiced and made gloriously awful paintings. Um, but this, this is at the canal. I think number eight or something like that. And so, like, this is my spot, and this is the spot that I felt like had everything I needed in order to be good, which was organic stuff. You know, a sky super green grass, water, and like a, a man-made linear structure. Um, but in terms of like, I can't find it, but in terms of like, how is it going to um, happen? Like, how are you going to make it one day or make it go back for two days or whatever? Um, that's a lot of the problem that I wanted to address when I 
started teaching it was the thing that held me up was how am I going to get all this? This is enormous amounts of information. When you're outside, it is completely not like when you have a photograph and you're copying it. Like that's flat and done. Everything's there. Outside, like from literally second to second, the light's moving, you know, there's a bug in your teeth, you, you drop <laughs> stuff, people are there. Like it's just an amazing amount of stimulus that is hard to get by. Um, but it's also really lovely to jump on that flow. Like it's this current and it's really lovely to just jump on that and just sort of go with it and get the things that you want to get and leave out the things that you don't. Editing is an enormous part of plein air painting, which is often left out of what people say is the way to do it. Um, but what I try and teach in my workshops is like a, a more direct route to getting whatever you want, either a realist painting or an impressionist or whatever style you want to go and finish it with. There are background and sort of underground uh, foundational things that can help you get there quickly right. um, and efficiently. Yeah. Yeah. And time, I don't think of because it's a trap. So when you're outside, like... I usually give myself three hours. I don't really do a painting that's more than three hours just because in that span of time, you know, the sun is going to switch quite a bit. It's going to be a totally different scene. Like, no matter what, it's going to change. So I usually, when I do classes, it's like a three-hour class and then a break and then we do an afternoon painting from, you know, one to four or whatever and then an evening painting if that's the thing. But it's usually like a three-hour span. You can get a good sketch in. Um, this past workshop I just finished teaching this morning, last week we started our painting, this week we went back into that painting and finished it. So six hours-ish about, you know, outside doing the same painting from the same scene um, is fine. It's really how you want to do it. I think as artists we are the most critical of our own work. You know, we all think the stuff that we are You know, it's, it's our perception and it's, it's our joy coming out on the canvas. It's, as Sometimes. An educator, I, I try to bring that to my students too. So yeah. I, I love the way you approach that and how you teach. Thank you. So thank you for sharing. That. Sure. Thanks. I would recommend this workshop. Mm -hmm. the, the, West, the, the West End. Uh, the, the West Park, Park one. Yeah. Desert. Yeah. The the West Park one that happens in June is. Um, like less than half the price of my usual workshops and the, the reason is because I want to raise a lot of money to give it to scholarships so um, and you have it every June well this is the second year and we had it in June next year I think it's actually it might be the it might be the end of May beginning of June it might be one of those but um, I'm on social media and you can I usually post it there um, the scholarship uh, I'm, I'm is going out tomorrow so on Facebook, it'll be an ad and it'll be on there and it's a submission of three JPEGs of your work and you can just get a scholarship for anything at the bomb school, fully paid. So that'll be up next, that'll be up tomorrow. Any other questions? All right, well, thank cool. you very much. Cool, thank you. I think this is fantastic. Thanks.